Now to an update on Oregon's first in the nation psilocybin program, commonly known as magic mushrooms. This week, the Oregon Health Authority reached another milestone. They licensed the first three facilitators for the program. Facilitators are the people who will be with you while you take the mushrooms and experience the effects. Today we spoke with one of the recipients of the facilitator licenses. We'll get to that interview in a moment, but first let's recap the psilocybin program to make sure that we're all on the same page with this. Okay, Oregon is the first in the nation to legalize psilocybin. You can't use it yet, but it is on the way. Voters passed measure 109 in 2020 with 55% of the vote. Then in November of 2022, Voters in 25 of Oregon's 36 counties said, no, not here. They voted to ban the legal psilocybin service centers, and several cities also followed suit. So it's going to be legal in the state, but not in every county. Okay, here are the possible benefits of psilocybin. According to the Oregon Health Authority, research suggests the compound may help with depression, anxiety, trauma, and addiction. Studies have also found magic mushrooms can increase spiritual well-being. Oregon psilocybin law allows anyone 21 years old or older to participate. You would not need a prescription or a medical referral, and you don't have to live in Oregon either. There won't be magic mushroom dispensaries all over the place like there are for cannabis, but there will be licensed service centers where you can take them, and you will be in the care of a licensed facilitator. The mushrooms will be grown by a licensed manufacturer and tested by a licensed lab for potency in order to determine the actual dosages. The facilitators will kind of be like therapists, helping you work through struggles in your life while the psilocybin takes effect. And that brings us to Jeanette Small. She is one of the three people who just got their facilitator license from OHA this week, the first legal psilocybin facilitators in all of America. She's a native of the Eastern European country of Moldova. Her family fled the, to Germany after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And at the age of 17, she came to the U.S. all on her own. She now lives in the Bend area. She has degrees in psychology from UC Santa Barbara with an emphasis in somatic work, which she helps explain here. So somatic psychology presumes that Rene Descartes made a mistake in assuming a duality between um, the essence of a person and our embodiment. Uh, the philosophical ideation in somatic psychology is around the fact that we are in fact embodied and the human existence is not possible outside of an embodied existence. So we take the body very seriously. We absolutely work with the senses. We work with breath and presence and relationship is absolutely taking into account the physical experience of our existence. She's worked with marginalized populations in Southern California, helping people who are dealing with opioid addictions and folks addicted to other hard drugs. And she thinks psilocybin can be a valuable tool for people who are suffering. We don't have a ton of medications. We don't have a ton of modalities that have been shown effective and reliable and safe. Um, and I feel like this is an opportunity for us as people to, to find new approaches to improving our lives, helping each other, people who are struggling, people who are maybe not struggling so much, but still feel disconnected from the world, from themselves from spirituality, from health, from whatever it is. I think that psilocybin has this unique opportunity that it gives us to, to find wholeness. She says the process that led to her being one of the first licensed facilitators was intense and quite the leap of faith. Small says the stigma around psilocybin is a big factor, as well as the fact that the federal government still sees it as a Schedule One substance. And on top of that, the coursework was no walk in the park. The program was rigorous. We um, so I was part of the accelerated cohort, and even though we completed all of the classwork within three months, I want to stress that we definitely did a lot of work. So we met on average four times a week um, on Zoom for two hours at a time, and additionally had homework and written assignments every single day, and then we completed a practicum. Um, in person for over a week. So it was quite rigorous and I do feel like I've learned quite a bit and my understanding about working with the substances improved and you know enriched through that. Becoming a facilitator like Small is not cheap, by the way. She paid around $10,000 for her training. And in order to keep that license, she has to pay the state $2,000 every year. 
And she hopes to open her own service center in the near future, which will come with an enormous amount of cost as well, of course, not to mention another 10 grand every year to license the center itself. And that's a theme that's really been making waves in this fledgling program. There's concern that all these fees are going to make it super expensive for customers. The state says the licensees can set their own prices, so these companies will likely have to charge a pretty penny just to break even. I come from clinical work and social services with folks who oftentimes are unable to afford food and shelter. I absolutely want to make that available to everybody. At the same time, we do have to navigate within the existing systems. And because it remains a Schedule One substance, we are not able to write off any of our operating expenses on federal taxes, which means that rent is just my expense that I have to absorb, um, legal fees, advertising, insurance. Insurance is going to be a substantial piece that we're not, I think, technically required to have. But personally, I would say it is a vital expense that we need to really take seriously. <laughs> um, yeah, it is quite a lot of overhead and that is going to be driving up prices in order to make that business successful, you know, just sustainable. There's a lot to it, huh? So now we've read your emails and listened to your voicemails when we've done previous stories on the psilocybin program. Many of you are not going to come anywhere near one of these service centers once they're up and running. As I mentioned before, citizens in more than two dozen Oregon counties have voted to keep the centers out of their communities altogether. So we asked Jeanette what she would say to those Oregonians who want nothing to do with psilocybin. What I want them to know is that what we know is that psilocybin has very, very low toxicity. So while we have some claims about the beneficial effects, honestly, this is still something that we're going to be exploring. There might be some people who are not going to be seeing the, the healing potential that they have been promised. That is true. But we're not likely to see the really negative effects either. People are not going to be addicted to the substance. This hasn't happened over the thousands of years that they, these substances have been in use. So there's very, very low addiction potential. There's almost no potential for overdosing in all of the literature reviews that we've done. It doesn't seem like anyone has died from having consumed too much of this medication. And just out of those considerations alone, the fact that this medication is safe enough to try, I think it is worth giving us a chance to explore that substance. And the people who are likely to benefit are people who otherwise might not fit into that healing community, you know, veterans, people who are struggling with the later stages of cancer, who are transitioning out of life in a way that how are we able to support this if not through the substances that can assist? How are we able to support you know, the heartache that folks are experiencing if we're not giving them a chance to to try. So I hope that we're able to demonstrate the efficacy of the treatment soon and that the counties that opted out are able to hear it, are willing to hear it and look at it with an open heart to really consider it not from a political or moral standpoint, but as a medication, just like when we go to a pharmacy and we take medication that helps us. I would like them to give us a chance to to demonstrate that there's potential for that. Well, we're still months away from any of these service centers being open. The state still has not licensed any of the labs for testing or the service centers themselves. In fact, OHA has only given out six licenses so far, three manufacturers and three of those facilitators. So there is a long way to go for those of you hoping to use psilocybin soon, but the process is definitely underway. Still to come on the